Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 7.0 oh, where we're down to the third of our three um, single generation problems where we're combining our understanding of meiosis and of mating to understand how genotypes are inherited. And in this problem, we're going to do something quite different. We're thinking about a, not a big um, set of progeny from a plant. We're thinking about one child of two parents. And we're going to illustrate this problem with a drawing of the type that genetis call, geneticists call pedigree drawings. So here's our problem. A married couple plans to have children, but they're both carriers for the allele of the CFTR gene that causes cystic fibrosis when heterozygous. So both parents have one defective allele of this gene. And they're concerned that their first child could be homozygous for this very harmful mutation. And they want to know what the probability is that their child will be, will be homozygous. So the first step is to draw the relationship that we're thinking about, to guide, again, a drawing to guide our thinking. And the kind of drawing that we're going to make is the kind of drawing called a pedigree drawing. And there's a standard set of symbols that are used to represent family relationships. We draw a square for a male, a circle for a female. If they're, the male and the female are married or mate and are going to have children, we connect them by a horizontal line. And when they have children, we draw a line down from that. If there's just one child, we just draw the line down. If there's more than one child, we put a crossbar across and then have the various children coming down from the crossbar in the order they were born. So this would be the first child, the second child, the third child. If we don't know the sex of somebody, we can't draw a square or circle. Instead, we draw a diamond. So to draw a pedigree illustrating this relationship, this is what it would look like. We've got the father, the mother, and the child who isn't born yet, so we don't know what sex they could be. Now the second step, we've got a drawing indicating the relationship we need to think about. The next step is to draw onto this drawing any genotypes that we actually know. And in this case, we know the parents' genotypes. They're heterozygous for the defective allele. So one way to simply represent that is to just put the parents' genotypes as plus minus. We don't know the child's genotype. Now what? Well, the next step, after we've assigned the genotypes, is to think about the gametes and the proportions of different genotypes among the gametes. Again, this is pretty simple. Because both parents are plus minus, they're going to produce only two kinds of gametes, plus gametes, which will be half of their total gametes, and minus gametes, which will be the other half. Now, we need to think about a single individual. So we're thinking about a single sperm meeting a single egg. So we can think of these numbers as representing also the probability that the sperm or egg will have the plus allele or the minus allele. For some people, it's more comfortable to represent probabilities as percentages, and that's fine. It's the same number. 50% is the same as a half. So these are the two gametes that the parents are going to produce. Now we need to think about how are these gametes going to come together in the child? And again, we can draw a mating square to guide our thinking, even though this time we're just thinking about one person. But the mating square we draw will be the same. We'll draw two compartments for the mother's gametes and two compartments for the father's gametes. And all we have to do is remember that the size of these compartments is now representing probabilities of the genotype of the gamete rather than the frequency of the genotype of the gamete. So again, we've got plus and minus gametes, 50% plus, 50% minus, and we've got plus and minus gametes from the other parent, 50% plus, 50% minus. And the 
child's genotypes are plus, min plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, minus, minus. The genotype that we're concerned about is this one, the probability that the child will have two defective alleles. And we can see from our drawing that a quarter of the time, 50% times 50% is 25%, a quarter of the time the child will have the minus minus genotype. So we can write that in, minus minus p equals 0.25, which is the same as p equals 25%, p being the symbol for probability. So that's the answer to this problem. Now I've got another version of the problem for you that's more complicated. And it's more complicated because in this version of the problem, the father doesn't know his genotype. The mother knows she's a carrier, but the father only knows that both of his parents were carriers. He doesn't know if he's a carrier. So again, we're asked to calculate the probability that the child will be homozygous. And again, our first step is to draw the pedigree. Now we're drawing three generations, not just the mother, the father, and the child, but we've got the father's parents on the pedigree as well. Again, we can assign the genotypes that we know. We know that the mother is heterozygous. We don't know the father's genotype, but we know that both his parents were heterozygous. Now, again, we predict the gamete genotypes and their proportions or probabilities, and it's exactly the same prediction as before. 50% for each heterozygous person, 50% of their gametes will be plus, 50% of the time their gametes will be plus, 50% of the time their gamete will be minus. Now, the complication is we don't know the father's genotype, but we can come up with a description of his genotype, again, by drawing our mating square. So this time we're going to use the mating square to think about the probabilities of the father's genotype. Again, we've got plus and minus alleles in equal proportions from his parents. And we have four possible genotypes, minus, minus. But now we have some information about the man. We know that he doesn't have cystic fibrosis. That tells us that he's not in this category and that what we're interested in in thinking about his genotype is we're interested in these three boxes of our mating square. And in one third of the boxes, he's one of the three boxes, he is not a carrier. He's got two wild type alleles, but in two thirds of the boxes, he is a carrier. So for the man, we can say that probably equal, probability equals two thirds, that he his genotype is plus minus, that he's a carrier. Okay, he's got a two thirds chance of being a carrier. So we could write plus minus P equals two-thirds. How can we use that to predict the probability of the child? Well, one easy way to do it is to say, well, if we knew for sure he was a carrier, we've already used our mating square, and I'll just sketch it again just to help us keep straight. Now this is a mating square for the child, for the parents in this cross. We've already used our mating square to tell us that the probability of a child being in this category is 0.25. But that's if her father was known to be a carrier. In fact, there's only a two-thirds chance her father is a carrier. So instead of the probability being 0.25, the probability is two-thirds of 0.25 which is about 17%, I think. I'm, I haven't done the arithmetic here. It's one-sixth. So again, we can use simple drawings of the process we need to think about. First, the pedigree showing the relationships of the individuals and their genotypes as best we know them. 
uh, writing down the gamete genotypes and using a mating square to think about how the gametes are going to come together to produce progeny. In this case, we're thinking about the probabilities of particular gametes and offspring instead of the proportions of different offspring and gametes, but the logic is exactly the same. So we've done two pedigree problems here, one fairly simple, one more complicated. And in both of them, we used pedigree drawings and mating squares to help us think about what was going on. For the first time, we thought about two generations of parents, we thought about individuals instead of populations, and we thought about probabilities. Coming up next, we're going to shift gears a bit and move back into thinking about relatedness. This is important because it's going to take us back to some of the thinking about ancestry that we did in Module 6, and some of the thinking of genome-wide association studies that we did in Module 5. And our improved understanding of relatedness is going to shed more light on those processes as well. I hope to see you there.